Do you have a 3D printer and kind of wish you could make stuff in solid metal? At least one of you does. I got a comment. I have a 3D printer, never done any casting. For me, it'd be awesome to get a video on how to get started with metal casting, such as the tools and maybe where to get supplies. You got it. Now metal casting has a couple versions. Uh, last week I did some investment casting and the overwhelming uh, reaction to the comments was, wow, that's really cool. Wow, that's really expensive. And that is a lot of equipment. I don't have room for five or six things this big and $5,000 to spend on all of it. And really, if you don't have your heart set on like ultra ornate things that are about this big, you might want to look into sand casting. There's a lot you can do with sand casting at home, especially if you have a 3D printer. People get 3D printers, right? And they make a bunch of cool plastic stuff. And then other people look at it and say, well, that's cool, but it's only useful for making plastic trinkets. No, it's not. No, it's not. We'll go over more about that right now. You'll see by the end of this video, they are very much useful for more than that. That aluminum bronze forging hammer that I made years ago, sand cast from a 3D print. The aluminum bronze spear that I also made years ago, also sand cast from a 3D print. My little shop sign here in bronze, sand cast from a 3D print. And it's not just things like this, that Gingery lay them building, that's all sand cast. And most of the patterns are 3D printed, at least mine are. But I get it, finding equipment is a bit overwhelming because it's scattered all over the place. You don't know what to get. You don't know where to get half of it. And then all the metal, you just watch the videos of people doing it and they pull different things out of nowhere. And you're like, what is that? What's that called? Why are you doing that? But we're gonna simplify all the equipment today. Assuming you have a 3D printer, even if you don't, I'm gonna give you a list of everything that you need to go from zero to some metal casting. And then at the end, I'll try to help you answer the next question. Inevitably, okay, I got all this stuff. How do I use it? But first, the stuff. What are you gonna need? Well, first, you can't sand cast without sand and something to put the sand in. This is a very simple way to start. You can buy this. This is called a flask. It is two pieces. This you can use vertically. You don't have to build it from wood. It has little locating pins and you can buy it with a kit that comes with 10 pounds of Petrobon sand. Petrobon, the red sand. If you watch videos and see they're using like a red looking sand, that's Petrobon. Petrobon is an oil bonded sand. I personally like it because it's really sticky, which you want in a casting sand. And unlike green sand, which is the main alternative, green sand is a water bonded sand. Uh, you don't have to worry about moisture. I can leave it in an open bucket for five years and it will not dry out. In fact, it'll be just as good the very next time I go to use it. I have never once had to worry about moisture and Petrobon gives you really nice detail. If you're just gonna get started, just buy a bag of Petrobon. Now it's sticky and you're gonna need something called a riddle. A riddle is a, a tool that you pass the sand through to just break up the clumps, especially when you're first like putting the first layer of sand down. A riddle is not a special fancy tool that you have to pay a million dollars for. Here's mine. It's a metal kitchen sieve and it is wrecked. I need to buy a new one or I just need to go into the kitchen and steal another one. That's where I got this one. Uh, it's, it looks like it's maybe a 16 mesh. I'm not sure, it's fairly coarse sieve. You can see I've pushed a bunch of sand through there. So if you ever see people taking the sand in the videos, putting it through and either shaking, you can't really shake Petrobon through, you have to push it through. That's why we call it a riddle. You can call it a strainer, kitchen strainer. You probably have one that you can just swipe out of the kitchen. Next, you need parting powder. All of the stuff I have at reach. I've been using this. Now this is Johnson's baby powder and it's a very old bottle of Johnson's baby powder, which means this is talc. Modern baby powder is not talc. It's generally cornstarch. Cornstarch does not work. So instead you go on Amazon and you look up parting powder. You can get a couple pounds of it. It's gonna say uh, non-silica par parting powder. That's important because traditionally foundry workers used silica powder, which is glass finely powderized glass. And that is murder on your lungs. You might as well be breathing asbestos, right? You don't want to breathe any parting powder, obviously. Asbestos and silica are really bad. You can get parting powder now, foundry parting powder designed to work with Petrobond on Amazon now. Next up, a dross scooper. When you watch metal casting, you might see the crucible with the molten metal in there and there'll be like a skin or there'll be a bunch of grime on the surface of the liquid metal, right? And they usually take some kind of scooper and they scoop it off. Uh, I've been using this, a scavenged stainless kitchen spoon. I clamp it on the end of some vice grips, wear a big leather glove and just scoop the crud off the top. Now I'm gonna show a picture of one that's a stainless steel spoon. It's a very small end and a very long handle. And the reason for that's gonna be obvious in a little bit when we get to the melting furnace. The larger your crucible is, the bigger the end of the scoop can be. But if you're just starting out, I suggest you start small. Next up is an ingot mold. I have a couple here, they're different sizes. These are graphite. When you melt metal, you often melt more than you need. You definitely don't wanna melt less than you need, right? And you need some place to pour that because you can't leave it in the crucible. I usually pour them into ingot molds like this. 
I like the graphite ones because when the metal cools, when it's cold, you just pick it up, tip it over, ingot falls out. If you try to use like the uh, muffin tin ingot trays and you pour bronze in there, the bronze will braze itself to the muffin tin. That's not good. It will not braze itself to this. Also, these ingots are very small and that's important. You will see soon when we get to the uh, furnace. Speaking of furnace, if you're new, I will suggest you start with one of these. This is an electric furnace. I've shown it a bunch. It's been in a bunch of videos. You program in your temperature and it, it takes you up to temperature and then it holds it right there. It's really nice. You don't want to use one of these to break down like scrap. Like if you're, if you're melting down scrap, this probably isn't the right one for that. You want to use a propane one for that. But propane one is uh, difficult. It adds more complication. You have to get the, the fuel mixture right. Uh, it's difficult to maintain the right temperature. You can overshoot or undershoot very easily. This is, a very, this is the smallest crucible for this thing. Uh, this melts one kilogram, 2.2 pounds or so of copper. And that's a lot of bronze. Most of the things that I've made, that, that big aluminum bronze hammer was only 2.2 pounds. And you notice here, that's small. Your draw scooper, if you need it, needs to fit in that opening. And if you make ingots with the extra metal, that ingot has to be small enough to fit through the opening. See, it's all coming together. I recommend if you're new to this, start small like this. You don't wanna learn new things, right? When you're holding six kilograms of bronze molten on the end of some crucible tongs. This is a very good kit because it comes with the furnace, two crucibles, tongs for the crucibles, and leather gloves. There are propane kits that also come with like a bunch of that stuff, but then you gotta go buy propane. Some of them don't come with burners. The tongs that come with those are kind of miserable. The electric ones are just easier. Now the metal. Where do you get the metal? Well, there's a bunch of places you can buy it. Uh, I'm gonna link a few down below. Uh, Rio Grande is one. Here's some from Rio Grande. I've also purchased metal from a company called Roto Metals, rotometals.com and belmontmetals.com. They all seem like good places. This right here from Rio Grande. Rio Grande is a, a jewelry supplier and you can get five pounds of ancient bronze, which is copper and tin, for less than 20 bucks a pound, which is cheaper than the cost of just like nice copper ingots, right? And it comes in this very clean grain. Ooh, shiny, shiny, shiny. I don't know, I dropped one. These pieces are super shiny, they're very clean. I think they include deoxidizers already because it flows really nice. I've never had any dross or any crud I had to scoop off from it. Anyway, that's how big the pieces are. That's useful because you can measure out exactly how much you need. And it's surprisingly cheap for how nice the metal is. Just make sure whatever metal you get, uh, it comes in a form like grain or shot that fits inside whatever crucible you have. So if you can get it in a half inch, half inch balls or something, that will fit in there. If you buy a gigantic ingot, like the zinc ones that I got, which are this big, that won't even fit in my giant propane one. I gotta cut them in half. Just something to be mindful of. Now, printable parts. There are some tools that you can't just go and buy. They don't have them in a hardware store, they don't have them on Amazon, but you have a 3D printer, so you can just make them if you get the right files. I will give you the files. This sand rammer that you've seen me use in many videos for many years was cast from a 3D print. That's basically how I do metal casting. Here is a printed version of it. I have used the printed version also as a sand rammer and it works. You don't need to go all the way to making in metal, but what, am I not gonna make one in metal? Of course I'm gonna make one in metal. Here's how they print. You can print them flat without support material on an FDM printer. And I've been told it fits on a Mars 3, possibly. It definitely fits on like a Saturn, I will use Saturn resin printer. You print two, get some locating dowels in there, stick them together, you can use it like this or you use the dowels to help center them while you're ramming them up as a split pattern. I have the STL for this on my mini factory. Go nuts. Another tool, which you probably haven't seen much in a video, is a wrapper, a wrapping tool. This is what it is. If you have a pattern and it's got like, sometimes you put screws in and then you kind of pull up on the screws to help you get it out of the sand. Well, a wrapping tool takes that and you go, you wrap it back and forth. It kind of jars it free and then it lifts out nice and easy. It's a very simple tool. It is probably not required. I didn't use one for years, uh, but I got a file for one. Also on my mini factory, you can have it. Go nuts. Next, I have some uh, gating tools. I use this to form something called a pouring basin. This is a tapered sprue former. I have runner formers. These can, these can help you design the ways that the metal go through the mold. You want it to be, you know, nice gentle curves, not a lot of turbulence, don't suck a lot of air in there. Uh, spin traps, some people use those. All of my gating tools that I use are 3D printed. They're easy enough to 3D print. I don't have the files for all these available because uh, the design of them really depends on the uh, flask size and design. 
So they're, they're very much more individualized, but if you make a flask and you design and print some of these, they're good for you. Um, if you're using this small cast iron one, you really don't, like, do you really need a sprue former this big? It doesn't fit, that's what I'm saying. Now, patterns. I've already shown you this. Traditionally, a lot of patterns are made out of wood. I don't have time to carve all of this stuff. I can 3D model it and I can print it relatively quickly. So you can make 3D printable and castable stuff very quickly. Now, there are also a couple of things that you can just find probably around your house. First one, two socks. Get a pair of socks. No holes. Take one sock, stick it inside the other sock. Then in the inside sock, the inner sock, fill that with your parting powder. The way you use that, you take the sock and you shake it over the pattern or whatever you need the parting powder on. It will come through the socks and distribute nice and evenly around the pattern. Nifty, right? Two socks and the parting powder. Now to go with that, I would suggest swipe a makeup brush from your bathroom. I don't know how long my wife has been missing this, but uh, here it is. Now this might be more important because I just spray the powder out of the bottle. But what I use this for is I move the piles of parting powder like into nooks and crannies that I didn't get because this doesn't squirt out as easily as the sock shaking thing. One of these might be useful. Might also be useful for brushing loose sand away. Next up, a striking tool. Now that's when you're, when you're ramming up the sand, you get to the top and it's kind of lumpy. You need to shave it smooth. I use this. It's just a piece of angle iron. Probably use a ruler, metal ruler. As long as the tool is longer, then your flask is wide, you can scrape the extra sand off the top. No special tool needed. You can also use a board. Boards don't work as well as, as angle iron. Then, lastly, you need a vent wire. Here's mine. It's basically just a TIG filler rod. I use this to poke holes through the sand, which allows air to get out more easily. If you're not into welding, you don't have a TIG welder with a filler rod you can swipe, go in your bedroom closet, find a wire hanger, straighten that out. You now have a vent wire. Using all of that stuff that I just said, you can start sand casting. You don't need thousands of dollars of investment casting equipment. You just need that stuff and you can do it. Once you get going, then you can scale up. Bigger flasks, more sand. Uh, that's about all you need. Bigger flasks and more sand to scale up. Everything else is the same. But now I hear you asking, okay, great. I can get all that stuff. That seems easy. I have no idea how to use it. How do I use it? Good news, I can help you with that too. I am launching an online course. It's designed for people like you to take your 3D printer and use it to learn metal casting. I believe if you learn like multiple maker skills, they compound on each other. They drastically increase the ability that you have to make cool stuff. And I wanna help you with that. 3D printers are not just for making plastic trinkets. I know they have their reputation. That's not the case. You just have to know how to use them in a targeted way. I wanna help you take your 3D printer and learn this new skill so you can make your own cool stuff. A lot of the stuff you can sell on Etsy. Go check out Bronze Custom Sign Makers. Those are all sand cast. You can make custom parts for your own other projects. There's, there's tons of stuff you can do with it. And if you're interested at all, sign up and I will email you a copy of this cheat sheet with all the stuff you need, including all the links and where to get it. As soon as I figure out how to uh, do that. But that's it. All that equipment is the equipment you need to start that course, nothing else. Tune in next time where I will sand cast some cool Gingery lathe parts from a 3D printed pattern. See you next time. <laughs>